school okay <laughs> right thank you so Sorry about uh, that. yes yeah so out of print has this tagline we want to read your stories we want your stories to be read and uh, this is a magazine which is published quarterly and features work in english or translated into english our guest tonight is dr indira chandrashekhar the founding editor of this magazine indira is a scientist writer literary curator and the founder and principal editor of out of print indira's fiction focuses on the short form and draws on her scientific experience working with the complex subtleties of biological macromolecules <laughs> published in anthologies and literary journals across the world a collection of her short stories polymorphism was bought out by harper collins yes <laughs> welcome uh, indira uh, welcome to the thumbprint conversation and uh, yes we want to hear your stories we want to uh, know why you write so uh, <laughs> indira um I just go back to your uh, you know past go back to your past as a scientist you have a phd mm -hmm. in biophysics and prior mm -hmm. to committing to fiction writing you studied the dynamics of biological membranes at research institutes in india the united states and the switzerland mm -hmm. so please tell us more about your life in the world of science before we get on to your life as a yes. writer yes gladly so some people are sending messages saying before we get into that some people hmm. are message sending messages saying uh that they have a problem with the video but now it seems to be all right again so let's hope it keeps going um okay thank okay. you so first I of all teresa for of asking me yeah there are a lot of messages yeah a lot of people are watching yeah yes. great Mm -hmm. Yes, good. First of all, Teresa, thank you so much for asking me to be part of your Thumpin conversations. Mm -hmm. I've followed them on Facebook for a mm -hmm. while, and I uh, follow in some important uh, footsteps. So, um, many mm -hmm. writers have been in your conversations. I uh, I know, and so it's really a pleasure to be part of it as well. Um, I should mm -hmm. just deviate slightly to say that I first met Teresa at Kalaghoda mm -hmm. a couple of years ago mm -hmm. when she gave this uh, talk she was on a panel and was so dreadfully impressive and I'll never <laughs> forget it so <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> so my life in science you asked me about um mm. Yes, it's very interesting because um I was working in science with biological macromolecules for a very long time and mm. I was looking at molecules that are involved in really uh, the very mo the most fundamental form of life which is the yeah. biological cell and uh so it's a little the cell is a little in encapsulated bubble of uh, all kinds of magical fluids and magical organelles and magical molecules within it which uh, somehow um are able to procreate and uh, uh make themselves uh in their own form again and this is really a very um it's a very strong thing to carry in your head you know and it informs you in many different ways um i was working particularly well i did a little bit of work on dna but i was also working on biological membranes and membranes are a, again an amazing sort of uh, uh entity because they consist of all these individual uh, relatively small cell, uh, molecules that i have a picture of here from some old work i did i don't know if it's visible at all and uh, yeah. these are the molecules you see and then they aggregate and then they form these uh membranes that uh in which uh which then form these encapsulations and the gateways for the cell um to carry out its uh its function and so i was working with these biological molecules mainly and um 
yes, that's what I did for many years. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then uh, you started writing fiction with an increasing focus on the short story upon returning yes. to India. So, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, after more than 17 years abroad. So was yes. it like a home ca- homecoming of sorts, you know, coming yes, back? And then... Very much so. Yes, very much so. Um, you know, the thing is, I was actually working in computer simulation. So I never really worked with these wet molecules. And so when we were moving back to India, uh, after all these years away, uh, and I was coming here with my family, I had left as a young woman single, and I was coming back with a family. And of course, we'd visited over the years and uh, been with my parents and so on and so forth. But I was coming back. Easy. I have my computer. I just have a setup. Uh, I can log in. I mean, even in those days, you could easily connect to computers across the world and servers across the world, and I'll just continue. But when I came back, there was just such a bolt of stimulation from returning to India. And um, I think, you know, somewhere within my soul, I just missed the energy of India. I was always very happy wherever I was. It's not that I wasn't. But there's just something... I think maybe stepping away, you see it with fresh eyes uh, of the energy and the complexity, the huge injustices often that are in your face. And um, you can't escape them. You, You hide away in your little home, but you still can't escape them. And they started impacting me. And uh, I think that um, I always used to write as a little girl. My mother said I wrote good stories, but I I think that impulse came back to me. So somehow the science faded out and the fiction took (laughs) over. (laughs) So uh, tell us about Out of Print. What, how did Out of Print start and why did you call it Out of Print and, you know, yes. (laughs) Yes, I think many of my friends may have heard this story before, so they'll have to bear with me. Um, Mm -hmm. But the thing about, uh, the thing is then I started writing and then slowly I started refining my craft and working at it and reading a lot of work to see, you know, see how I could improve and tell my stories better. And I have to acknowledge I had a couple of really wonderful mentors as well whose um, input and um, guidance made a big difference in my writing. Uh, I wanted to publish, and um, there weren't many places at that moment in time to publish in India, actually. Um, I, you know, I, I thought, oh, Illustrated Weekly and Femina and um, et cetera, et cetera, but, um, you know, they were not there anymore. They were gone. So I started looking around for uh, journals in which to publish. People, again, are saying they're not getting the link, but I'll send them the YouTube afterwards, so it's no matter. Yeah, Um, you can do that, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I started looking for places to publish, and then I was talking to my daughter and my niece and my family, and suddenly it struck me that it was worth actually maybe starting a journal oneself. And um, Mm. I think I didn't think about it too much. I just plunged into it. And I had a couple of really wonderful uh, people who supported me. So that made a huge difference. And uh, a wonderful designer and wonderful web people. And so we were able to create this this entity, this platform for publishing. And um, Mm. I think the thing is, as a writer, yourself, uh, you value a platform because you've struggled to find a place to put your fiction into. And so that was part of the journey. Um, You Mm -hmm. asked me why out of print, the name, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. uh, for two Mm -hmm. reasons. One is um, at that time, you know, it was around 2008, and a lot of the journals I was looking at to publish my own work were outside of India, and many of them, of course, for the short story in the U.S., because the short story is a Mm. form that really has developed and grown and uh, refined itself in the United States. And so um, 
I was looking in the U.S., lovely journals. It was 2008, the economy crashed, and many of these journals that were either college or university journals supported by different organizations, they no mm. longer were supporting them. So when the economy crashed, um, many of them who, who had online platforms or, or, you know, they seemed like sort of secondary things or did mm-hmm. not have online platforms at all, they just elevated the online platform to become the journal. And Mm -hmm. uh, so I was coming in around then. We started out of print in 2010, 10 Mm -hmm. years ago now. And um, yeah, and so then we, um, it just seemed to make a lot of sense because the value of an online journal is you don't have to post it to anybody. You don't have to run out to the printer and get it printed, which I was quite incapable of doing. I can tell you, it was a huge stress for me. And Mm -hmm. um, And then furthermore, I think because at that time it was sort of the contemporary space in which people were publishing, um, Mm. although we were a very serious literary space, uh, a lot of Mm. younger writers felt that it was an accessible space. It wasn't some grand, you know, um, academic journal or printed book in which they had to uh, live up to something. Uh, they just mm. um, they just sent their work boldly. So we had a lot of mm. young. We continue to have a lot of young writers submitting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, so that's. Mm. You never thought of bringing out a hard copy. Well, you asked the key question, and I hope my mm. literary agent Jaipriya Vas- Vasudev is watching. <laughs> But indeed, we Mm -hmm. are planning to do so now for the 10th anniversary. Um, We want to uh, bring out a print anthology uh, with select stories uh, to celebrate the 10 years. So that's the hard copy. But I don't think we do it on a quarterly basis. I, you know, I think if you're also a writer yourself, I would just get sucked into managing all of it if Mm -hmm. I were Mm -hmm. doing a print journal. And this gives me enough space to explore my own writing mm. as well and and further mm-hmm. it just ha- it's a different it has a huge reach you know I have readers mm-hmm. and writers submitting from all over the place from New Zealand to Australia to the US to you know mm-hmm. or, of course the entire um, Indian subcontinent and so mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. it's uh, it's kind of an important <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, during a conversation this morning, you were referring to one particular story which reminded you of Northeast India. So can yes, you tell us more? very yeah. much. So. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, because I should tell uh, our listeners that Teresa asked me if I'd ever been in the Northeast. And mm-hmm. um, I uh, have always wanted to go there. And I had various friends and uh, relatives who would say, come and visit, and it's really a fantastic space, and so on and so forth. But um, we never managed it. Then we wanted to do the tourist thing of going to Kaziranga, which I think, despite being tourist, would be certainly worth it, but we never managed it. And then I was working on a joint project with someone who's up in the hills in the Northeast, and we never managed it. But... Funnily enough, somehow, I think that's the magic of writing. I Mm. do hope one day to make it and come and participate and be part of something. But I think the magic of writing is such that you end up actually feeling as if you know a place. It's an illusion, of course. But feeling Mm. as if in some way you have a window into the place through writing. So this year we have a, um, this issue of Out of Print, which is coming out very Mm. soon. Uh, We have a piece of writing by a wonderful Bangladeshi writer, very well known, called Shahin Akhtar. And uh, it's been translated by Kavita Chakma, who's who's from the region about in which the story is set. And the story Mm. is set in the Chittagong Hill Tracts. And I have Mm. to say, I... um, wish that I had uh, asked them to log in as well. Um, mm. But um, but I have put it on Facebook, so they should be aware of it. It's mm-hmm. set in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, which is already a, a besieged region, one could say. And it's about displacement, um, which takes place when a dam is built in the area. 
this is a this is a, this is reality. It is so that a dam was built in the area, and the uh, uh, many many villages were submerged. And there's a young boatman, the Barker, who uh, is um, runs a little tourist boat on the lake. And for him, he's now in conflict. He's making money from um, boating people on the lake who are these ignorant young tourists with no knowledge of the history or the tragedy of the place. And, um, but he's making money from them. But at the same time, every time he wanders along the lake, he stops at various people wondering whether it's his ancestral home. And so um, the, I'll read just a little paragraph. It's just wonderful, really. Sure. Um, but how to recognize grandma's home after 50 long years? Huge mud houses mm. dissolve like salt in the water. There was a pair of mango trees at the front of the house compound. He knows this from his grandmother. That's passed before. Mm. They bore fruit for three months of the year. It was not only one or two jamun trees of jamun trees surrounding the large house kept watch like sentries. In summer, Grandma and her friends played games with shells under those trees. Throw each dice with a mouthful of ripe jamuns that have fallen from the trees, they would sing, young girls with their purple mouths, or walk under the jamun trees with bare feet, anklets sporting purple feet. Life was colorful and full of dreams. After the dam was built, government officials came and marked the large trees, mango, jamun, nut, river ebony, jackfruit. Then they came to cut them, fallen trees all around, sawdust, big tree trunks, trees that had been planted by grandparents and their ancestors. They had been grown with care. Holding back tears with a lump in her throat, Grandma said, they were rolling like healthy children on the ground. Trees, so you can't hear them cry. They were cut down to make safe passage for the boats and the launches to ply. Mm -hmm. Stop there. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's deeply tragic, but it also is um, a wonderful story because in a way... Um, he finds resolution by entering another reality. It's a wonderful story. I hope people will read it on Out of Print. And I'm mm -hmm. proud and honored to be publishing it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, actually, you know, uh, you, you've come out of your lab and then now you have, uh, you started writing yourself and now you've started editing as well, you know. And yes. uh, uh, personally, I always felt that editing is a thankless job, you know, uh, but, uh, and it calls for a lot of patience. And um, I don't know, I, yes. I would just like to ask you, what do you think are the nuances of editing? You know? what, 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 what are the things that uh, an editor should take into account? I think the thing about editing, which is uh, undervalued, I think, and I'm very glad you raised that, that most people don't recognize it, is deeply mm -hmm. undervalued, is that it takes a lot of mental energy and commitment and belief in somebody's work to enter into their work. You know, you're reading a story, and it's not just you're, you're not reading it for pleasure, you're not reading it for critical analysis, you're actually mm -hmm. entering their story and uh, mm -hmm. writing it or entering their writing, rather. You're not writing it, you're entering their writing. And therefore, mm -hmm. in, you know, you might change a typo or some punctuation, mm -hmm. but it's more than just that copy editing. It's more than just the familiarity or facility with the language. It's by entering the story, you're actually looking at the structure of it and trying to think about how you can make it stronger, better, sharper, um, bring out the power of the story. And it takes a lot of mental energy, actually. You know, after each issue of Out of Print, I can't write myself for a few days. I'm, I'm just so full of everybody else's work. And mm -hmm. I have to sort of uh, de-link from that before I can go back to my own uh, writing. And so I think that's the thing about editing, which I think is um, uh, under-recognized. 
And um, I always value a really good editor. I always value someone who's able mm. to look at a story and say, oh, this doesn't work or that works. Um, but over the years, of course, I think I'm fairly good at editing my own work as well. So <laughs> it's, okay. it's uh, just a habit and practice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, yes. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned that as a child, you used to write uh, lovely mm -hmm. stories, short stories, uh, so uh, yeah. uh, could you tell us something about your childhood and uh, how do you think can children develop a love for books or literature or writing? Oh, that's a tough one. I think it's very individual. I think my I loved uh, write, reading. I mm. don't know if I used to write good stories, but my mother says they were good. And, you know, <laughs> mm. I think she does have good judgment, but she was also very, you know, she's a mother. But mm. uh, I loved writing detective stories because often, we, you know, we lived in Mysore and the electricity would go off when I was a child mm. very often. And, mm. uh, you know, there are all these ways you have of entertaining yourself or your parents have of entertaining you. And so all kinds of word games and so on and so forth, but also storytelling. And I was lucky enough that my mother and my uh, maternal grandmother and my mother's sisters are all great storytellers. And um, so we would always be entertained with all kinds of stories. And my grandmother was, uh, although she was um, uh, of a different generation, she actually could read in many languages. So she had a huge mm. range of reading as well. I mean, she would read the Puranas and so on as well. But she also read Perry Mason. And then she would retell these stories of a lawyer in America solving crimes and so on. So I used to love to write um, crime stories. <laughs> when I was okay. young okay. and I had a little detective mm. who would uh, solve all these mysteries. <laughs> Did you ever dream of becoming a detective yourself? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. I don't no. think so. <laughs> but, uh, mm. <laughs> and I think by the time it might have been a dream, you know, life had become full of uh, all these violent uh, American uh, movies that one watched and that was not my persona at all. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I did try to write detective and... stories when I started writing. Sorry to interrupt you, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I don't mm -hmm. know. I feel that my plots are very good. <laughs> you know, I feel anyway, okay. but they don't quite mm -hmm. hit the pace that you need for good detective fiction. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, you know, talking about your book, Polymorphism. It sounds so scientific, you know. <laughs> so can you tell us more about your book? What is it about? Yes, Why certainly. did you call it polymorphism? Yeah. And <laughs> can you show us your book again? Yeah. You want to see your book? Yes, I will. Yes, that is polymorphism. Yes. And this is another one, Pangea, that I was uh, edited and I have uh, also some work in. So this is another um, okay. anthology mm -hmm. that I was part of editing. So polymorphism mm -hmm. means multiple forms, you know, simultaneously holding multiple forms. And in mm -hmm. biophysics, it's a very important way in which um, molecules uh, function. Uh, it's not that they're simultaneously in multiple forms, but they can switch within uh, certain speeds that are um, appropriate for the particular function they're engaging in very quickly mm. between different forms, depending on what they need to do, whether they need to, you know, capture another molecule or let it go or so on and so forth. And so polymorphism mm. is something that's very much part of your investigation as uh, doing molecular dynamic simulation. Now, the cover of this book also has a, even though it's completely short fiction, it also has sort of a scientific mm. aspect to it, because I was thinking about mm how to draw in and connect the science and the uh, fiction. And um, one of my dear friends, Dr. Jyotsna Dhavan, is, uh, was working on, on stem cells. She does stem cell research. And uh, so she gave me some of the images that she has um, of muscle cells regenerating. You know, stem cells are these magical things which are able to uh, grow without grow themselves, you know, they're like the in the, the first forms of different um, organs in the body. And so she gave me these mm. um, beautiful images of these networks of cells that are growing everywhere. And, um, okay. and then we use that and the designer created this. 
the book mm. is a collection of short stories i was listening to your mm. um, um talk with andali uh, vaji uh, the other day mm. you, i think last week you spoke to her and she has yeah. she's a hugely yeah. prolific uh, hugely prolific writer i'm just the opposite i'm mm. a really slow writer i think it takes me uh, as long to write a short story as it does to write a novel really almost <laughs> okay. but uh, uh, mm. but uh, the stories grew out of my time in science and um in many ways sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously i was trying to investigate um Mm-hmm. some of the concepts that i had been concerned with in science and mm-hmm. for example the the idea of uh, uh molecules or atoms attracting each other and getting close enough that they attract and then getting too close so they repel um or molecules mm-hmm. finding you know trying to find another or an atom trying to find another one to uh, attach to and then finding the ideal distance at which they rest in a happy uh, equilibrium with each other you know, things mm. like that so that um, and then of course the idea always of the regeneration of life and um, the fact that um, somehow all of these chemicals are able to come together and create a system which wants to mm. form itself again and so that was what i was uh, exploring and so i was thinking that i could read a bit from one of the stories sure. if that's all right sure 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 uh, i i just want to explore yeah be, before you start i just wanted to ask you how uh, w- would a person without any background in science enjoy these short stories or uh, understand these short <laughs> stories <laughs> no just so. curious i uh, <laughs> yes well you have to ask the people who've read it of course i'm going to say yes <laughs> but i think mm-hmm. so because they really you see when i read that they are not actually uh, very direct they uh, <laughs> i have someone saying that's my son i have to say who said great author as a comment so <laughs> he's <Okay>. very well trained <laughs> um you uh, you have to um I I haven't really gone into a scientific aspect it's just that I'm using the ideas and sometimes they may not mm. even be specifically um obvious you know they they they, they may the scientific idea might be clear only to me perhaps or someone else who knows me or has talked about it with me often times it's just embedded mm. in there and so um yeah that's that's sort of the uh the idea so this this particular one is mm. this particular one is oh thank you devika devika is saying that they are good yeah, read she nice. says uh, not <laughs> sciency at all <laughs> great read <laughs> because i am not sciency at all i studied science only till my 10th grade <laughs> so when somebody says i'm a scientist uh, i feel <laughs> no okay no. let's hear you know, it from- Yeah. Yes, I'll try to find a section which is the most sciencey and um see yeah. if it's uh, <laughs> readable. So this is about a little family. There's a mother and two two daughters and the father's gone off somewhere he's on work and um traveling on work and uh the daughters have discovered or they know that they're actually um uh born of a um uh uh fertility um uh oh what's the word for it suddenly i'm blanking I, uh, I they're did. not born from their parents but through a donor yes exactly <laughs> sorry mm-hmm. and uh mm-hmm. but then it doesn't matter the loving family but there's a lot of competition between the two sisters mm-hmm. and there's one who is a very outgoing um active engaging charming uh, girl and the other one kanaka who's very introverted and one of the things mm-hmm. she often wonders about is why out of all the little babies that were formed in this process that their mother has explained to them um she and her sister were the two that were chosen to survive and so mm-hmm. that's one of the things that she's concerned about and um so she says um 
I'm trying to think where to begin to read. Um, mm -hmm. And so she says, um, yes, here we are. I think I'll just read from the end. She thought about her family, her father mm. and pa and ma. So father is the donor and her father and pa and ma, her parents, and her lost sisters. And she thought she understood what she meant by some bonds are closer. Sometimes you had to be like a soft bond, release yourself, climb out of the energy well so that you didn't crowd it. Lizards lifted one part of their foot up to make room for another. People probably had to let go of one person before they could connect with another. Maybe that's why her father had disappeared and her sisters, so as to make room. Was it Ma who had given her sisters the boost to go? Had she lifted them so far out of the energy well that they couldn't find their way back? But how had she chosen which one of them would go and which ones would stay? Maybe she hadn't. Maybe Ma hadn't. Maybe Renuka and she had simply held on tighter. So it's just, you know, exploring this idea of bonds and atoms coming closer mm. and farther away. And she's trying to make sense of this idea of, uh, of these um, surviving embryos. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so, definitely not sciencey at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very short bit I read, so I hope it made sense. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Indira, uh, just coming back to our theme, you know, uh, why mm -hmm. women write. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you've been editing this magazine for the past ten years. Do you have? Do you get? more women sending you write-ups or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, or you find that uh, more women are writing or not writing? Or, and why do you think they're not writing if they're not? Or, uh, no, they're writing. I mean, they're writing. Just explore. They're writing. Okay. They okay. are writing. I get a lot of submissions from women. And in mm -hmm. fact, when I put this anthology, I'm putting this anthology together the, for the print, potentially print edition, and if not a print edition, mm -hmm. something will come of it. And um, I have to say, somebody in fact said to me, uh, oh, you have a lot of women writers in it. I, I shared it with someone whom I'm close to, who is one of our uh, uh, supporters for Out of Print, mm -hmm. and whose judgment I trust. Mm -hmm. I don't otherwise, you know, I haven't really shared the anthology mm -hmm. yet with anyone else. And they said... Um, it's, uh, it's very women-centric, you know, and not in a negative mm. way, just that there are a lot of women's stories. So I don't know whether that's my editing preference, really, or mm. that I end up choosing stories written by women, or we have mm. more women uh, writers. I haven't really looked at the statistics. I should mm. ask my tech person to help me out with that. Uh, or, um, but we really do have a great number of submissions from women. And, mm. um, and from young men as, and older men, I suppose. Um, mm. But a lot of them from women, they're very bold. They explore a great deal. There's a lot about um, gender issues, about uh, sexuality, but there are a lot of stories just about societal issues. There are, of course, stories about the political situation. Mm. Uh, we have one story which will be coming out in this new edition, which is really a COVID story. And so mm. we, um, there are many, many women writers. And I think I return to the point I made earlier. Mm. Perhaps the fact that we are an online platform, people don't feel so hesitant to submit. But maybe that's not even mm. true anymore because now we're almost like a classical platform. There are so many other younger mm. platforms where people publish their creativity. And so mm. now we are almost like, a, like a, the old fogies. But uh, we have a lot of women mm. writing. But, you know, it's very interesting mm. because I was thinking a great deal about your title of why women write and why mm. we think about um, Because, I mean, in a way, the creativity of whichever gender is, is profoundly interesting and what drives people to write or drives people to create mm. is very interesting. And what is it about women uh, that, that makes it interesting and um, 
um, gives it a certain identity, I suppose, is, uh, is, is, is a curious question. And, um, mm -hmm. well, actually, it, it um, brings me to what, uh, to ask you, in fact, whether you, in, through the course of these, uh, I mean, you don't have to answer straight away, but through the course of these conversations, feel that there's mm -hmm. something um, particular about women's writing. And, mm -hmm. um, and I ask it also because when I started Out of Print, uh, Out of Print is focused on writing which has a connection to the Indian subcontinent. And um, very early on, uh, I was asked to be on a panel uh, on uh, journals for uh, writing um, mm -hmm. by Ranjit Hosko. And one of the other panelists was uh, Sharmishta Mohanty, who publishes Almost Island. Mm -hmm. And she was very mm -hmm. strongly of the opinion that she doesn't need to confine her writing to a geographical location. And mm -hmm. uh, really, any writing she finds the writing she wishes to publish and I cannot argue with that that mm -hmm. really is in an ideal world mm -hmm. what you would want and I still don't mm -hmm. argue with that but I just um, at that time I realized I was creating out of print for a particular geography lining that mm -hmm. a little bit to a particular gender say a particular geography because mm -hmm. uh, I as a writer had tried to uh, publish all over the world before there were other platforms in India. And, mm. um, and I realized that there is a sort of a cultural understanding and oftentimes people don't get what you're saying or you have to mm. explain too much so that people get what you're saying and you end up being an exotic writer. Which you and, and really there mm. is, um, I think, a validity in providing a platform where there is some common understanding in all of this diversity. Whether that's mm -hmm. a good choice or not, and I sort of think mm -hmm. about it from time to time. But um, mm -hmm. therefore, I return to the question, uh, why a particular gender, but, you know, in this time of great fluidity of gender and people recognizing all the, mm -hmm. uh, the complexities of uh, what it is. And it's, in mm -hmm. some ways, it's a cultural thing too, because in the classical trajectory that women take, good, bad, or mm. indifferent in the patriarchal mode, as it were, mm. there are spaces one's investigating uh, in a very particular way, I think, that, um, that women have access to, and it becomes the world of women. So you're, ex you're investigating um, mm. human emotion and human interaction and relationships and your responses to politics and everything, but oftentimes through a space that is maybe more domestic or more maternal or more uh, oppressed by the patriarchy. So I think there's a sort of an, it's a very interesting question, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> well, uh, actually, when Virginia Woolf said, you know, you need a mm -hmm. room of your own, you know, that space, yes. you know, um, yes. I think that space long time you know for yes. women to be able to sit and write you know space yes. as in not just physical space that mental space the time and uh, yes. you know and when you talk about women in science as well you know, we still have very few women who are yes. you know doing pure science so yes. that is because you know there are so many restrictions so many uh, and uh, when, as a journalist, you know, I, I was always, I always had this bias, you know, gender bias, you know, I would always go and talk to the women who were sitting silently and was, uh, you know, to, yes. to get that other yes. side of the story. And which is Absolutely. often missing, which is often missing yes. from our media reports, because I'm not a yes. fiction writer, I'm more of a reporter, I'm a journalist. So, and yes. uh, my, the previous two books as well, you know, The Mothers of Manipur and Bulletproof. Yes. You know, just basically yes. a gender angle to it. You know, I'm talking about uh, Bulletproof yes. is basically my own experiences as a journalist and as a female yes. journalist within quotes. Because yes. uh, I would yes. always say that, you know, you can be a good journalist or a bad journalist, but, you know, mm -hmm. your gender comes into play, especially when you are reporting from an inaccessible underreported yes. area and you are on your own and then yes. there are many other factors that come into play your safety your security mm -hmm. your 
you yes. know um, which uh, maybe your male colleague will not feel um, and yes. then so yes no. um, you know this whole thing about you know gender comes into play though i might mm-hmm. say that you know I, i'm i work equally well or i'm 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 as good as a male reporter but when i have to go out i'll have yes. to uh, you know and so this book uh, people ask me why did you call it bulletproof because uh, for a journalist reporting from a region like the northeast of india uh, we uh, many of us are bulletproof you know we we mm-hmm. don't we never we never got all those training and all those uh, bulletproof jackets to wear and when you go to a hostile terrain mm-hmm. so it's like mm-hmm. uh, we are on our own we have to maneuver our way and uh, we survive you know and if you are mm-hmm. lucky you survive uh-huh. so so these are the kind of stories that i've tried to tell and uh, this yes. is this book is particularly my own experiences as a journalist yes. uh, as a female journalist you know and then yeah, so uh, that's why yeah. yeah so that's why i feel that you know it's uh, maybe um, writing by women uh, was till very recently was uh, a domain of the privileged few you know uh, yes you maybe you are talking from a position True. of power and privilege but there are still many women who want to write and maybe they haven't got that space or the confidence yes you know yes yes be, no, the no, confidence i grant that, I grant that. yes yes the yes. maybe there's nobody to tell her that yes you can write you know so yes um, yes that's why we're trying to explore this uh, see, you know through this series of you know why women write mm-hmm. and we're trying to talk to women writing in different genres you know women Yes. who are writing poetry women who are writing non fiction women are writing purely scientific writing you know so these kind yes. of um and we've got different and no, even chiclets yeah so all okay. kind of writing yeah. you know, blogs you know right blogging yes. and uh, i think blogging uh, the, i think internet has opened up many possibilities internet has opened yes, up many I doors agree. you know you can yes. sit and blog and even if you didn't get a space in the so called classical or traditional media uh, to yes. publish you start yes. your own blog and then gradually yes. when you see you, you get followers and you get some confidence you gain some confidence and then uh, people yeah. have started self publishing books as well so uh, i yes. think that has been a big big uh, um, like uh, for me i started my own uh, the thumb print is a magazine which mm-hmm. i started the almost 7 years back uh mm-hmm. 2012 so uh yes. that was uh, you know because sitting in a region like northeast india i had to struggle to find space for my stories and yes. uh, people of uh, uh, when they asked me why did you start the thumpin i say it was a very angry reaction it was a very mm-hmm. angry reaction when i had to struggle to find space for my stories stories in the sense mm-hmm. i'm talking about journalistic stories Yes. So uh, yes. uh, and stories which I knew were of global standards you know I'm yes. uh, I'm competing with everyone but then uh, there's no space yes. for my stories so I decided yes. to create my own space I said I'm not going to beg for space from anyone yes. so uh, yes. and it's 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 like a miracle that you know I'm sitting in a small town in the yes. heart of Assam and I'm running this yeah. magazine and I'm talking to you right it's now amazing. it's just because of it's internet you know we've been yes, able to connect it's amazing yeah. yes yes so i think and that I think has changed so, yeah. that has changed world, uh, a whole lot of yes things, dynamics yes yeah. yes i agree and i think for women too because i do get you know not always the best quality from anywhere you can't i mean i can't say i can accept every story but i get stories mm. uh, from people from not just the urban um, uh centers you know where people have a sort of an exposure i get stories from everywhere and uh mm-hmm. i deeply commend you for bringing out thumbprint because i know it's a it's a great deal of hard work and in the end you're doing everything yourself you really have you're the mm-hmm. one you have to carry it so uh, mm-hmm. running a magazine is not a, a minimal task at all um mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting thing and it'll be very interesting to watch the evolution of the way women write. But I think mm -hmm. the inter the, you raised the point about women uh, also in high positions in science and I think there are all of the societal pressures that everybody knows about, which is, of course, uh, you know, women have to get married, run households, produce mm -hmm. children and so on. But I think one uh, aspect that I don't know whether it's given enough um, in, uh, sort of um, granted enough value in a way is the woman's own urge, your own internal urge to want to um, step away from that career and be with your family and your young children and, or, 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 or create these young children. It's, um, it's something that's a very profound uh, biological uh, and psychological uh, driving force. And it's not only that society oppresses you, your whole um, hormonal system oppresses you as well in that sense. Mm. Oh, oppresses might be the wrong word. Drives you. It informs you. It informs the choices you make. So that's a very mm. complex thing. And I think in, in some ways, if we're moving forward in society, one mm. has to account for creating spaces for that without saying that just your absence at a particular time uh, undervalues your contribution. You know, I, I don't know how that's ever going to be measured, but mm -hmm. sort of maybe COVID mm -hmm. is giving us this time to step back and think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are just, we are will be uploading these videos on YouTube. So whoever wants to, whoever's missed it, maybe they can just go through it. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, if there are any queries, they can always get in touch with uh, Indira. Uh, or you well yeah or me <laughs> we are uh, accessible on social media and yeah. uh, i think we are running out of time it was lovely talking yes. to you indira uh, thank you yeah. so much and thank yeah. you everyone for watching and uh, uh, do check out our youtube channel where we'll upload this video as well and uh, and hopefully this will be a resource someday for some researcher who's working on why women write. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Teresa, for running this so remarkable much. series and for inviting me to be part of it. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. so much. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.